This will be an interesting uh, presentation, um, creating self spaces, um, safe spaces for our kids um, in New York City. Not an easy thing to do. So we have, uh, and also, I'm sorry, in a, an, an, an example of a wonderful suburban uh, school district, which is doing exactly that same thing, creating a safe space within this structure of a public school district. Um, so it's really interesting. I know that you've all heard this in, in some of the other presentations, but our children really are uniquely vulnerable. If there was a three-year-old or even a six-year-old in this room, and there was some kind of a toxic thing coming out of the air conditioning units or whatever, um, they would be actually taking in twice as much of that toxic exposure than we do, okay? Just because of their, their body size, okay? They, breathe faster, they take in more of, um, you know, of anything uh, that is in their environment than an adult does. Um, and that's, you know, per pound of body weight, and that's uh, it's just their, their size. And if they were also in this room, they would probably be playing on the floor, three-year-old, uh, and the floor is where, you know, a lot of toxins wind up, especially in a place like this, which is um, carpeted with synthetic carpeting. Uh, and you know where it has been cleaned, I'm sure, several times. And so you have not only the synthetic carpeting and the formaldehyde and other chemicals that are found in that, um, but also those cleaning chemicals that find their way into those fibers and literally never go away. Um, so we're going to be talking today about positive things um, for our kids here in the city. And I would like to start with Andrea. Uh, I don't have a a bio for you, Andrea. That was something that, was something that didn't happen here. Um, so I'm going to let you come up and talk about um, what you're doing and uh, give yourself a little bit of a, an introduction. <coughs> Hi, how's everyone doing? Um, such a pleasure to be here today and honor with so many scientists and, you know, heroes and leaders. I learned a lot in the sessions I attended earlier. I'm really here today because Dr. Maida Galvez like invited me to be part of this and I pretty much do anything that she asked me to do if I can. Um, a big admirer of her and, and Luce who also works with her. Um, and so my name is Andrea Mata. I work for the New York City Housing Authority. I'm going to talk a little bit more. How many people from in the room are not from New York City? Okay, great. So we'll give a little bit more of an overview of what New York City Housing Authority, or NYCHA as we're called, is. Um, and my role in this organization is, is I lead a team that really works to build internal and external collaboration um, to advance our work to comprehensively address health issues. And I'm not going to go into all the details of all the health issues that we work to address. I'm going to try to stay on topic of what the theme of today's event is, but there's three ways that, that we do that work in a very large organization, which I'm going to show you a little bit about the scope of our work uh, in a minute. We work to connect public housing residents to preventive health re resources. Uh, we work to build partnerships that help create healthier indoor environments. There's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and we work to cultivate resident leadership in health, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, towards the end of my presentation. And so um, we are, I'm here today to talk about our work, like not probably as the suburban school district who's probably doing everything they can, has figured almost everything out. Really, we are in an aspirational place. We've made a commitment um, on related to IPM specifically, and I'm also going to segue into our partners at Green City Forest and the work that we do around farming in partnership with them, or that they do in partnership with us because they are really the lead um, partner. Um, but I am talking here to talk about how a very large organization, one of the largest residential landlords in the country, has made a commitment to deepen their work in this. Um, and again, I'm going to give an overview of us as an organization talk about our commitment and really what's at stake from a health perspective and the vulnerable populations that live in our housing. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our work. So I hope you don't mind. I'm just reading notes a little. It's a Saturday afternoon. I had a very long week. Um, but let's get started. OK, am I going to be able to figure out how to go down here? Um, oh, the clicker would help, yes. All right. So 
NYCHA is the landlord that houses about one in 14 New Yorkers. And we, if you look at us, our public housing population is officially about 400,000 residents. It's believed to be more than that um, if you look at people who are not documented to be um, residents in our housing. So that's about the size of the city of Miami, right? Like we are a city in and of ourselves. Um, if you include the number of residents who are housed in private housing, utilizing Section 8 vouchers that we also administer, you get up to the size of a city of about Boston. So we are a very large organization, um, large numbers of seniors and children, as you see, that reside in our housing. Citywide, um, over 40% of our units have at least one senior resident member, so we're considered in and of ourselves a NORC or a naturally occurring retirement community. Um, and we've also got a significant number of our employees that are also residents of public housing. You see a little information here about the average income of households that live in NYCHA. Um, over half of our households, and that, that number is probably even higher now, are employed. So sometimes when I'm speaking with young people, people still to this day have this association of public housing residents as being unemployed people that are on cash assistance, and that's really not the reality of the, the situation. But we are a large organization, and we are also an organization whose housing stock is aging very rapidly. Um, so we currently have 325 developments. Many developments are made up of many different buildings. So in total, just under 2,500 buildings, many of them large scale across the city that we directly operate. And that accounts for 175,000 units of housing, right? So it's, it's a pretty large, mind boggling operation, very much in transition, in the news, dealing with a lot of really thorny issues. Um, and a lot of it is, not all of it, but a lot of it is associated with chronic underfunding from the federal government. We have an aging housing stock, so nine out of 10 of our buildings are 30 years or older. And I don't have the slides today of just like years of disinvestment in, in capital investment in our buildings, the money that we need to be able to um, upgrade, you know, the plumbing, the electrical, um, the roofing and all that work around our buildings, but that is the situation that we are in right now. And so to talk a little bit about, you know, our hopes and our commitments, we had in 2016, we released something called our sustainability agenda. It was a very ambitious agenda. There's a whole lot of commitments around energy efficiency, um, which is not what I'm going to focus on as much here, but we also had a number of healthy housing commitments made in that. And so you can read through here and see some of what they are. Um, I just highlighted our commitment to fully adopt comprehensive integrated pest management. And you know, there's obviously some others here that relate to mold response. There's a lot of work that I could talk about going on with that right now. Um, Smoke-free housing, my team actually manages that. It is a multi, multi-year rollout. Um, really to change culture, and I don't mean any one individual culture, but just culture over time of what people do in their homes and their awareness of how it affects their neighbors and other members of their family. Um, and I do think it is a trend that we're going to see more and more in all types of housing nationwide, multifamily housing particularly nationwide. But it really is this integrated pest management commitment that we made um, that we are really pulling through the details now of what that means to actually put that into action. And so just to talk a little bit about what's at stake, right, the, the health status, what we do know about public housing residents, what we're looking at here is results of some survey, a citywide survey of New York City adults. And so you're comparing for certain conditions and activities, you got smoking there, because again, I, I work a lot in smoke-free housing, but different conditions, comparing NYCHA residents in the, what are we going to call that, yellow-green, to other New York City residents who are not NYCHA residents. And you see, for example, you know, significantly higher rates of asthma. These are adults, again, we're looking at um, diabetes and hypertension and, and higher smoking rates as well. And so there's also been some analysis um, that looks at preventable hospitalizations, hospitalizations that are deemed to be preventable, um, and also seeing much higher rates of that across our developments as compared to other New York City residents. So clearly, you know, we're, we're getting more and more a picture, picture of some of the issues and the challenges and opportunities that we have to work with health partners. Um, you know, asthma is something that flag, gets flagged a lot in healthy housing. Um, obviously today, 
a lot of panels have been talking about other health conditions and things that are related to pesticides. I mean, I heard in earlier sessions discussion of obviously endocrine system disruption and all the associations around that. Um, and also mental health, somebody mentioned suicide in the earlier panel. There's a lot of work that we do around um, mental health partnerships and suicide prevention more and more actually. So, um, but just to go back to the asthma a little bit, this map just shows, so this is New York City, um, and then all the dots represent NYCHA developments where we are scattered around the city, and the main emphasis of the map is just that we do have a concentration of public housing developments in the very same neighborhoods in New York City um, that are considered asthma hotspots. And this is, again, looking at a, um, adult asthma hospitalization, although you would likely see very similar trends for children. So to take this back to pest management um, and integrated pest management, I don't have an actual slide with the numbers, but I'm just going to read off some numbers here of the number of work orders that we have. Again, we are a landlord. We are responsible for maintaining these buildings. So in a given year, how many work orders do we have for pest management? Anybody want to throw out a number and guess how many we have for roaches? I'll just say. In a year, across our whole portfolio. 400. Sorry? 400. Okay, so I mean, 146,000 work orders in a year to deal with roaches. That's the largest group, about 59% of all pest-related work orders. 44,000 for mice, that's number two. Bed bugs at number three, I feel like this is a game show. Okay, ding! Bed bugs at 24,000. Um, and the last one is rats at 19,000. So um, lots and lots of pest management work happening at our developments across the city. So again, we are working, trying to figure out what this integrated pest management is going to look like for us in our large portfolio with our large staff, many of whom are unionized folks, people who have been in these jobs for years, and their identity is exterminator. I am an exterminator. That's what I do. I go out and I spray. That's the activity that I do to respond to infestation. So we have a lot of steps that we have to go through and work that we are engaged in. Um, and I just want to sort of run through a little bit of this. So obviously, removing and replacing toxic products. I am not here to say that we have removed all the toxic products, but we have removed some. Um, that are kind of at the top of the chain that we have discontinued. And actually, I'm sad to say that these are things, many of which we purchased within the past five years, um, at a time when we really weren't paying attention to healthy housing in a way that we are now. But there are some that we've already eliminated, and I think that there will be more that we will eliminate over time. Um, I'm sure you all, like technical science people, will probably ask me for details, which I may or may not be able to give you. But the other big piece of what we're doing is just, again, the policy and procedure redesign. How do we... What is the official procedure that we ask our maintenance staff to take to act out when there's these work orders coming in that is dramatically different, that is within the framework of integrated pest management and not just routine spraying of pesticides. This is my routine spraying of pesticides sign. I don't know if that's really <laughs> an adequate representation of what it looks like. But um, the staffing, you know, do we even have adequate levels of staffing associated with this work? And I'm not just talking about the people who are called exterminators right now. I'm talking about what we call also skilled tradespeople, right? The, the carpenters, um, the plasterers, the people that actually have to go in there and plug up the holes, you know, remove the access and the point of travel for the pest coming in and traveling from unit to unit. Um, so a lot of that staff training and like even designing training and rolling it out citywide, a lot of thought has to go into how are we also involving staff as agents of change, um, again, when there are people who may have been doing this a certain way for decades. Um, another thing that we're leveraging and looking at is enhanced data collection. I have another slide on this, but just what do we know about where the trends across different developments, or how much do we know about whether pests are traveling vertically or horizontally within buildings, um, or even how a particular unit that has a chronic problem relates to other units um, surrounding it. and. Um, and all of that happening. And then there's certainly the resident and partner engagement. So I know there's there, the panel earlier than I first came into this afternoon, there was a lot of dialogue of, wow, what is the public perception and interest at this point? You know, a lot of our residents, um, upon initial discussion about this, their perspective is, if it's not aggressive routine spraying, you're not adequately taking care of the pests in my building. So a lot of engagement and dialogue and, and really, um, 
thought change around that as well. And the, the other piece of this is our overall waste management plan. So we, have, we are redesigning the way that we deal with waste. Our buildings were built um, really with um, the idea in mind of burning the trash in our buildings, that's the way that they were designed, right? We don't do that anymore. Now there's a huge effort around transporting from building to building to central trash depository, having the Department of Sanitation come in and remove. But we're really redesigning the way that our waste management happens. And obviously, there's a lot of associations um, between that and, and how pests thrive or maybe do, are not welcome within our developments. And this is just a picture at the tra data tracking and um, management. So. We are part of a neighborhood rat reduction initiative that's citywide, some elements of which I think are not consistent with IPM and organic um, management, but some that are, because part of what's happening is um, we are finally able to get some capital funds to install some door sweeps to make sure that the, some gaps on apartment doors um, are bridged and we're installing some rat slabs in our basements. Um, and we have some additional staffing that's able to take preventative measures really when rat incidents start to peak rather than waiting for a total infestation and then having to do really aggressive toxic response. Um, so this is part of citywide work, but there's an effort to um, track borough by borough. There's three neighborhoods that are the target of that work. And so I'm gonna transition and wind down here and hopefully we can have some dialogue after. Um, but I just wanted to say that from our viewpoint and my small team, um, a lot, when we think about organic strategies and sustainable community environmental health, a lot of that to us is about resident leadership, community leadership in this work, right? They are the people who have lived in these <laughs> developments for decades, will continue to live. So we work a lot on leadership development and cultivation. Green City Forest, which you'll hear about in a minute, is a huge example of that. But some other things that we see here is you know, policy discussions with residents around our smoke-free policy before we even designed it, um, engaging community members to build a new playground, um, and a lot of work around food justice and food access, and this is actually Green City Forest team, were you there? That's Department of Health last year, um, so sitting around and talking about what does health mean, you know, what, what is health in our communities, and so we have um, different teams that are helping really guide us, keep us on it. So there's in certain developments, we have what's called resident green committees, groups of residents who have convened and are working over the years on a number of different issues. We certainly have the farm leadership. Um, and we're also working right now on community health worker careers and how can we build pathways for public housing residents into that expanded world so that we have more local health leaders who are um, doing the work locally, but also like employed and, and have career opportunities to advance their involvement. So I'm gonna stop it there. I, I, I don't wanna say too much about the farm's work because Erin's gonna lay it all out us, for us, but it, it is work that started, well, the first farm was built in 2003 and has really grown from there. It's a huge priority for us um, for a number of different reasons. And I'll hand it over to Erin to lay out a little bit more about partnership. We just have a little bit of information here about Andrea. She's a senior manager of the community health initiatives in the New York City Housing Authority. And I am particularly interested in hearing this as well. Um, we have also engaged in um, community farming. Uh, it's very different in a, uh, in a suburban community, but we do use the land of a, um, of a historic property, and we grow food for the local food pantry um, for those residents uh, in, in our community and in surrounding communities that don't ever get access to fresh produce. So I'm very interested in hearing about how you're doing this in the city. <clears throat> Hi everyone, um, my name is Erin Johnson. I am the program manager at Green City Force. Uh, so Andrea referenced us a little bit, but um, Green City Force is a green jobs training program for young adults in public housing. Uh, so it's, it's an AmeriCorps program. They're with us uh, full time. It's all um, public housing residents uh, who are these AmeriCorps members. Um, and th our primary service that they do uh, is in, in NYCHA developments, um, moving towards um, more, you know, NYCHA sustainability goals. 
uh, and then simultaneously training members um, for jobs that are then advancing sustainability. Uh, so, like I said you heard from uh, a little bit about NYCHA from Andrea. Um, this is public housing in New York City. This is uh, one of our farms. Um, in, in, especially in NYCHA developments, there's a lot of um, environmental justice issues, right? You know, this, this is part of uh, uh, the reality in, um, you know, low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color is, is these injustices. Um, whether it is, you know, the, the health inequities, like the asthma, um, a lot of those health issues um, are, are, you know, plaguing these, these poor neighborhoods of color more so than, than affluent neighborhoods. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't go too much into this, but, you know, there's a lot of issues in, in the public housing, like the mold and the lead. Um, it's been in the news, unfortunately, a lot. Um, and so it's, you know, it's really important to be addressing that and for us to be building more clean and green spaces in, um, in these neighborhoods who don't necessarily always have access to nice things. Um, and you know, definitely not being the cause of introducing more um, poisons, toxins, chemicals. Uh, so we have six large-scale urban farms uh, at, in NYCHA developments around the city, um, three in Brooklyn, one in the Bronx, one in Staten Island, and one in East Harlem. Did anyone make it there yesterday? The Wagner House this farm? No. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's one of our farms. Um, so uh, we call them farms, not gardens, because they are producing food at a large scale for distribution. Uh, you know, a lot of NYCHA developments do have small um, sort of community gardens where individual residents sort of maintain their own, um, their own garden beds. Um, but this is at a larger scale, uh, run by um, our core members um, and some partners. So they're, they're, you know, they're doing all of the, the farm work. Um, at each of the farms, we're growing upwards of 4,000 pounds of food. So last year, across the six farms, I think it was about 27,000. And that was the first year for two of the farms. So production is probably going to increase for those two in this coming season. Uh, so uh, that food is harvested on a weekly basis. We run weekly farm stands from June through November. And I'll get a little more into that later. Um, but this is, this is our Howard House's farm in, in Brownsville, uh, in Brooklyn, and this is Wagner, um, which some of you saw yesterday, obviously was not that lush yesterday. Uh, this is peak, peak season. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people think urban farming, they think, uh, you know, rooftops or hydroponics. Um, but in nature, you know, you have these primarily towers with space in between. So we're able to have farms on the ground. Uh, they range in size from a third of an acre, which is Wagner, uh, to almost two acres. Uh, Baby Houses in Canarsie is our largest. Um, and everything we do on the farms is organic. Uh, we don't have an organic certification, um, but we're, uh, everything we're doing is organic practices. Um, so there's a number of ways we are able to avoid chemical use on the farms. Um, when we're doing a build, this is uh, Forest Houses Farm in the Bronx, in Morrisania. Um, whenever we're doing a new build, we're always laying down landscape fabric uh, because the soil is contaminated. Um, it's, all, it's all brown fields. Um, you've got lead, arsenic, all sorts of not good stuff that you don't want to be growing food in. Um, so we lay down landscape fabric uh, and then um, wood chips on top of that. So uh, that not only creates a barrier to any of the toxins in the soil, um, but then it also um, helps us reduce weeds. Um, so we're not then having to, to spray for weeds. Um, so that's one thing we do. Uh, obviously we have bugs. Um, some good bugs, some bad bugs. Um, our, our primary method for dealing with uh, our not so, not so good bugs is, is manual removal. The farms are at a scale where we're able to, to sort of do all of that manually. Um, and we have teams at each farm site about twice a week. Um, 
So we do a lot of just manual removal, um, whether that is picking up and killing grubs, caterpillars, um, or spraying. Uh, so we'll spray, you can usually spray aphids off um, and white fly just with water. Um, so we'll, we'll just use our hoses um, to spray the leaves off. It's primarily on a lot of the leafy greens. Um, and then we'll also uh, deter pests with neem oil, vinegar, soap, sprays, different you know, non-toxic um, things we can spray on, on our veggies uh, to, to keep the bugs away. Uh, and then sometimes we'll introduce beneficial insects like ladybugs. Uh, but you know, we, we obviously have, have bugs um, and uh, uh, we're prone to any, any of the sort of um, diseases and, and you know, things that, that plague farmers no matter what size. Um, so for, we also do manual removal for, um, we get leaf miners in, um, something in the amaranth family, so beets, spinach, chard, um, and that's just pinching those leaves off, and the earlier you can catch it, you know, the more you can prevent it from spreading. Um, on the right, you can see there's some powdery mildew on, um, on that zucchini. It's on, it affects a lot of things in the cucurbit family, um, so squash, zucchini, cucumbers. Um, so yeah, we just try to catch it early and remove it um, as best we can to, to sort of slow it and stop it, and then any infected leaves um, will go in the trash instead of compost because if you put it in the compost, you're just helping it spread. Um, and then we also practice crop rotation. Uh, so if the uh, squash vine borers found our squash in bed three last year, well, hopefully they don't find the squash in bed five next year. Um, we, uh, in addition to bugs, our other farm animals are rodents. Um, not to our liking, but it's a reality. Um, so this is also at Wagner House's farm. Um, and one of the ways uh, we'll keep, keep rodents out is as a physical barrier. So you can see those boxes in the middle of the bed are um, strawberry boxes. I think that was when they were just being constructed. Um, so the rodents really like to eat our strawberries, so we put them in a box with a frame with um, chicken wire on top to keep them out. Um, but we you know we can't control the surrounding waste management. Um, obviously, it's something you know NYCHA is is addressing, whether it's through operations or residents. Um, so when there's construction or poor waste man poor waste management practices, you know that's when you see the rodents come, um, and you know they like to find their homes in, in, um, in, our, in our nice soil. It's a nice place for them, uh, not for us, but um, you know, the, the problem then is, is that a lot of the residents then associate the rodents with our farms. They think it's the cause of it, um, which is, you know, it's an unfortunate um, perception issue. Uh, but, you know, using, using rodenticide is not really an option for us because then you're putting that right where you're growing the vegetables. Um, and that's, that's, you know, just not an option. Um, another uh, practice uh, we use to deter pests is uh, companion planting. Um, so we'll plant marigolds or garlic. Um, just, you know, a number of things you can do that either attract um, beneficial insects or, or deter insects. Um, so you'll see, you know, a lot of um, our rows have, have marigolds at the end. It's a good one. Um, and then we use compost. Um, almost all of our farm sites have three bin systems. Um, we also work with a number of partners where we get, uh, we get compost from the DSNY, um, so we're not using chemical fertilizers. It's all um, organic. The, the nutrients are coming from the compost. Uh, watering is uh, a bit of a challenge for us. Um, everything we do is by hose or by sprinkler. Um, and when you are spraying, you want to, to, you generally want to water at the roots, um, but it's hard to do that when you've got this much kale and this, you know, on this large of a farm, right? Um, so it's just a lot of hose, hose spraying um, and sprinklers, and that sometimes is contributing to the spread of, of pests um, and disease. So, um, 
uh, stuff will spread from the soil, splashes up on the plants. Um, it affects tomato plants sometimes. Um, and then it also contributes to the spread of powdery mildew when there's a lot of dampness in um, that stays on, on the leaves of the plants. Um, so, you know, we try to, you know, practice proper plant spacing so that, um, to, you know, to destroy the spread of mildew. Um, and we are starting to introduce some drip irrigation systems at our farms, um, which will um, be a much, you know, much more effective solution. But, you know, some of the farms are only a few years old, so every year we're doing a little, a little more. Um, and it's not just, you know, environmental justice issues, it's also the, the interplay between food justice, health, um, and the environmental justice, it's all, it's all interrelated. So the farm sites were chosen um, as part of um, the Building Healthy Communities Initiative, all except our first farm in Red Hook. So the purple neighborhoods are the targeted neighborhoods, I think. Um, and then the carrots are where our farms are. So these are neighborhoods that were targeted for um, health interventions. Uh, and so that's why, why the farms were brought there um, as a way to make this, you know, healthy organic food accessible to residents, to engage residents to be a place of, of um, community engagement and community building and having events and just activating spaces. Uh, so we run weekly farm stands um, where all of the produce is harvested and given away to the residents basically for free. It's, it's meant to be an exchange, um, so we ask that residents either give us um, food scraps, which we use for compost, or uh, volunteer their time, and then in turn they, they get the veggies. And I mean, these are, you know, neighborhoods where organic food is, is financially or physically unavailable, um, and it's not necessarily a thought, or it's not really an option. Um, but in this way, we're able to provide that, um, you know, for free. Uh, and we do, we'll do, we do cooking demos um, and some workshops also to teach the residents, um, you know, about about the food we have. Um, so I did say I had that same picture, Andrea. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll grow, you know, a lot of things to meet resident demands, um, whether that's, you know collards or scotch bonnets. Um, and then we'll also um, introduce new things. So in the Red Hook houses, we have a large Chinese population. We grow a lot, a lot, a lot of bok choy and cabbage. Um, but we'll grow that, you know, in some of the other developments too. And then it's introducing it to residents, um, you know, to teach them about it. Uh, and they gladly, gladly take it. Um, and these are community spaces. They're open. They're not fenced and gated, you know, they're meant to be for the development. Um, and so we're liable to have uh, kids and adults alike, you know, getting up close and personal with these spaces. And so that's a, a responsibility we have to make sure that they are, that they are safe and clean spaces. Um, and that, you know, if a kid eats a handful of soil, it's going to be okay. Um, and we do uh, a lot of farm-based learning. Uh, so at most of our farm sites, we have some formal way of bringing kids onto the farms um, through school trips um, or summer camps. Um, and they, you know, this is, the kids are much more susceptible to, to anything and everything they're putting in their bodies. So it's really crucial that, um, that these are spaces of, of health and well-being. Um, so they get to take the veggies home, they introduce it to their families. Um, which is really great because then the, the families come back. Um, and I think with that, I will pass it on um, to hear more about school since we're talking about kids. Yeah. And our last speaker is Pat Pizzo. He's the super assistant, uh, sorry, assistant superintendent for business and finance at the East Meadow Schools in East Meadow, New York on Long Island. I've known Pat for um, quite a long time and he has done really incredible work within you know, a public school environment where uh, there's not always uh, you know, an opportunity to change the way things are done. Um, you know, New York State has a lot of influence over 
um, you know, what happens in schools and how things should be done. And Pat has really been a, um, a leader in, uh, in, in making change um, to make children a lot safer. Okay, as uh, Patty mentioned, I'm Patrick Pizzo. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Business and Finance at Spano Schools. So it may seem a little bit strange I'm speaking um, about, about green cleaning items like that. I spent uh, the majority of my career on the facility side. I was the Director of Facilities for many years. I also teach sustainability at Hofstra University. And I think that you talk about, uh, about things that are done in regards to uh, safer solutions uh, for children, I think the person, the premier person I know is Patty Wood. So if anything, we're, we're trying to follow her lead. And I'm happy to say, after, uh, after all of the years that we've uh, had our program in East Meadow, which it's now uh, 11 years, um, we're able to now reach the, um, what, we, uh, what we believed in. We're able to practically do it. Uh, one of the, um, the things that we had when we first started our program, I can't come up here and say that we always had it right. Um, schools, it's been a long road to this path. I started out in New York City schools. Uh, there were not green programs there, and there was resistance. And I think the resistance was primarily uh, attributable to um, the belief that there weren't options out there. And I think 20 years ago, there, there could be an argument made. That argument can't be made today. Today, there, um, there are viable options that work as well as these petrochemical products. Um, we can and do prove that while we're, uh, while we're implementing our programs. And the interesting thing is uh, we've actually seen, and this is a byproduct of this, uh, that we actually have decreased cost. So to maybe get everyone's attention on that, so there's a, a couple of different uh, perspectives on this. So really start out with why. Uh, when we started, uh, started out, when we, um, there's a, a green clean reg, uh, regulations that deal with schools in New York, as we know. And we wanted, to, uh, we wanted to meet those standards. So what we did when I first went into East Meadow is we created a baseline that was in compliance. And then from there, um, we decided to look to get better and better. So what we started out with was, was something that was more on the traditional side. And before we were able to look at financial benefits um, or really getting to the green ideal we wanted to get to or the uh, indoor air quality, a lot of the different things we're talking about with indoor air quality, we're going to get into that a little bit. Um, we had to make sure it works first. We had a responsibility to make sure we were using products with proper kill claims and that we were addressing issues. So as our pro pro uh, program evolved, we were able to find solutions where uh, the green products would be switched uh, in for traditional products. But we only did it once we knew it worked. So that's important for me to say because uh, I think that negates the, the argument that, um, well, we can't do it. Well, you can. And we, we know because systematically we only changed over when we, had a, uh, when we had a product that worked as well or better than a traditional product. And this is not just by, uh, by viewing it. We do uh, tests for germ loads. Uh, we, have a, uh, we have a detailed procedure in regards to reviewing kill claims. And we also look at products uh, through the components that are the active ingredients within a product. So you could have a product that is considered green under, say, a green seal, GS37. Um, does that mean is it doesn't, that it doesn't contain petrochemicals? Well, the answer, the answer is, unfortunately, there are many products that, that could uh, come, uh, comply with current green standards, but they still contain petrochemicals. They're just watered down. And that's the reason why there's dispensing systems. So what we've discovered in East Meadow is that when we have a product that's green, it has to be bio-based. To me, if you have a petrochemical, uh, you're, not, uh, you're not a green product. So that is something that with our program as it evolved, we completely moved away from, from products that contained petrochemicals. So you could see something and you look at an HMIS sheet on a safety data sheet. Look at health. If you see a one there, why is the one there? That's what we would investigate. Uh, zero is the best that you can have. Four is the worst. Virtually all the products we use at this point in East Meadow is zeros. The only, uh, the only exception to that would be bloodborne issues. Bloodborne issues, you still need to have the kill claim. 
but that's only to be used on a very limited basis. So this is the way we define our, our program, is that, is that everything is important. We actually, in East Meadows, stopped calling our program a green program. I actually wrote an article a couple of years back um, where we call our program now Cleaning for Health. I think people have misconceptions about green. Our program is green, but it's not green because that is the, uh, it was the original intention. Our intention was to have the best program possible. When you have the best program possible you, and you research and you come up with the best solutions, your program, it's a symptom green. It's not something that, that you need to, to uh, be locked into because it will just occur. If you use the best products, you're gonna find that you're gonna go back to green products. Petrochemicals do not have a place in uh, cleaning products. It was, it's more of a, it was more of a marketing issue when it comes to, uh, to how to use these petrochemicals um, a gener uh, many generations ago, uh, and people have come to accept that, and they shouldn't accept that. Okay, so we talk about, you know, I gave kind of an overview of this kind of from 10,000 feet, but let me really talk about how we, how we actually go about doing some of these things. Okay, uh, if, you were, if you were using a cleaning product and it wasn't green, and you replaced it with the product that was green, and you're switching one chemical for another. I think that's what people associate green cleaning with. Can okay, I give you a better solution? A better solution than a green product for a non-green product is to, uh, is to get away from products as much as you can. Chemical avoidance is what we look at. And what's a way that you can, uh, that you can get into chemical avoidance? You see some of the things that we have up here. Yeah. Um, chemical avoidance would be terrazzo. With terrazzo floors, the common approach for a terrazzo floor is to put down wax. If you put down wax, you need to use very harsh products to get the wax up. The stripper that you need to, I think I just shut myself off. Okay, just hit the screen, okay. Um, yeah. So the, the, um, the uh, products that lift up wax are very often uh, contain no carcinogens. And the labor that's involved in this. Now, if you look at all of these, all of these different factors that go into maintaining terrazzo, a better option is using a diamond pad. What a diamond pad does is it addresses the stone. It's not putting, it's not putting a, uh, it's not putting something on top of the surface that has to be removed. So think about this. Our intention was to remove stripper from from the environment because I don't believe that stripper should be used in a school building. It shouldn't be used around kids, even though. You're not doing this cleaning while the students are there. It's not something that belongs in the school building. So with terrazzo floors, once you get rid of the wax, you, know, you get rid of the stripper. So now you have savings where? You're not buying those products anymore. Uh, but it goes deeper than that. Also, uh, you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to continue to treat the floors as often as you did before. You can, um, once you have a floor that is prepared with a diamond pad system, when you have a, a day, which we have in New York a lot, where you have snow and, and calcium chloride is dragged into the building, what happens with a wax floor? It eats into the wax. If you don't have wax, it doesn't eat into the wax. It lays on the surface. Then what we do is we have an auto scrubber, which doesn't use chemicals. We use a, um, it's, it's called a, it has a, um, it activates the water. So the water becomes a surfactant by an electrical charge. And we will use a, uh, we'll use a auto scrubber with the attachment for the, uh, for the, to uh, charge the water to make a surfactant, up and down the hall, it looks just like it did before it snowed. So you're talking about, about something that's better for the environment. And let me get into why. Um, we talked about, about known carcinogens being in, in the uh, stripper products. Well, uh, it goes beyond that in regard to problems. What makes wax hard? The binding, uh, the, the binding agent for wax is styrene. That's what, well, that's what is, uh, is the product for wax. So when you're, when you're going and maintaining these wax floors and you're buffing these floors, you're throwing into the air dust. And what's dust? Primarily uh, you know, dead skin cells. But also you're breaking up the floors that are held together by styrene and you're throwing these, these chemicals up into the air. So when you're using a diamond pad system, you're, you're getting away from from uh, the styrene and the wax and the known carcinogens in the stripper and you're saving all the cost in regard to that. So I would think now as, as, a, as a practitioner, my thought would be, well, 
Okay, that's great. Terrazzo, we have it in the hallway. What about the classrooms? Classrooms are tile, primarily in Long Island. Overwhelmingly, they're tile. Well, what do you do then? Well, we looked at, at, at this as, uh, as a real issue because uh, there's always been the thought that green wax doesn't work. Now, that's something you hear about green products again and again. It doesn't work. And you know what? If you use the wrong procedure, it won't work. Same way if you use the wrong procedure for a traditional product, that won't work either. So you can't take a traditional product, replace it with a green product, and use the process that you used previously for the traditional product. You need to change the process along with the product. So it's not a matter of, of, of chemical A for chemical B. It's a matter of changing how you deal with, the, uh, with whatever the change is. So let me talk about green wax. The problem with green wax has, tr has uh, traditionally been that it's not as strong, that it'll flake, uh, it'll flake off and you're not going to have a, a, a seal on the floor. Yes, if you put it down the wrong way and you use the wrong product, that will happen. What we've discovered, if you use a green wax and you uh, buff it after you put down two thin coats, put down a couple of more thin coats, buff it again, what happens is with those initial two coats, the heat from the buffing fuses it to the floor, becomes your sealer coat. <coughs> Then over on the top, you add additional layers, and, and you're going to buff that again. Now, the biggest cost you have in facilities is going to be your labor costs. So I, 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 you know, if I'm, a, I'm sitting out in the crowd, I'm saying, well, what is this guy talking about? You know, all these guys buffing these floors, all these uh, men and women on the custodial staff bu uh, uh, buffing floors. Well, yes, it is a little bit more labor up front to set it up. But we're looking, these, these buildings, we're looking long term. So you have to look it through the entire product life cycle. So we put a little bit more in up front. We make sure you have to get all the old product up. It's like you can't put, like you can't paint water base over an oil-based paint. You have to bring up everything. So it's the same, same thing goes here. You have to get that, the old uh, product up. We'll talk about different solutions for that. But once you get that up and you get down to the raw, uh, raw surface of the tile, you build it up using that process. So it seems like it's more expensive. It's not. You have to look at the life cycle. One of the, um, one of the problems with styrene, besides the, the point that there's many, many health implications to, uh, to having styrene in your environment, one of the problems with styrene is it yellows. The reason why you need to remove wax every year, some places more often than that, is because the floor yellows and becomes uh, dull looking, so it looks dirty. Whether it's dirty or not, it's going to yellow. It, inter it, it, um, it, it reacts with the sun and it yellows. You don't have styrene in green wax, so it doesn't yellow. So while the, um, the next summer, when uh, with the traditional program, we would have had people stripping floors in 96 degrees and 99% humidity, we would have been stripping floors. What we did with our green program is we took a red pad, we scrubbed the, uh, we scrubbed the marks out, we pulled up the dirt, we lifted the dirt away, and we just top coated it again. That's where all of our labor came back. And it turns out that you have a, a massive savings in regard to that. And to me, um, doing my dissertation, I spent many, many years reading medical journals on the dangers of these products that we use and you know, touch on briefly about out with fields, in buildings. Um, so to me, it's always been about, about really doing what's best for kids. But the reality of it, uh, of it is, as a practitioner, I have to be able to I have to be able to defend it to a board. I need to defend it to the community. And we produce reports to our Board of Education quantifying what we do to show that, we're, that we've done, um, had some great leaps forward with savings. There is an impact on kids, though, and we're going to get back to that. Um, one of the other things I want to mention is about with wax, with traditional wax. When you need to lift that up, it's very strong in the stripper products. But there's another approach to that as well. What you do is instead of, using, uh, instead of using chemicals to lift, there's a product that is a uh, machine that's a square pad scrubber, which is like a big palm sander, which is more aggressive. And with a, with a square pad scrubber, which is virtually the same as what a regular machine would be, um, you're able to, uh, to avoid using chemicals. Then once you get over to a, to a green program, like I said, you're just scrubbing it, you lift it up once every three years, and you're able to break the bond with just water and a black pad or um, using a square pad scrubber. Okay, um, 
wanted to, to touch on uh, something else. Uh, what is the best, um, a lot of things people are very concerned about germs with, um, with children in, in schools. Uh, see a lot of people are, are using hand sanitizers regularly. Uh, uh, this is something that's completely unnecessary. The best option for washing hands is to use soap and water. It creates the surface tension, you wash the germs away. Why would you want to have chemical warmth warfare in your hands? Uh, some of the products that are used that we have banned in East Meadow, alcohol-based products. What does alcohol do? It dries out your skin. It makes an easier point of entry. You're doing germs a favor. I, I, think, there's, I think you probably have a net negative by using a, uh, an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. There's some other products out there in regard to, um, to hand sanitizing. Uh, benzimonium chloride could be involved. You could have triclosan. All very harmful chemicals which aren't needed. Okay, and we talked about uh, some, of our, some of our methods with, uh, which involves uh, the equipment changes, um, some, of the, uh, some of the different things in regards to equipment. And if you look at all of this, um, what we're really doing is we're very cost conscious as we're doing this. We didn't have a huge, uh, a, a huge amount of money that was bestowed upon us by our Board of Education to do this. We did this within the scope of our regular budget, the way we just changed, changed uh, our process. And um, another product I would like to, uh, to mention is a, um, and this is part of looking long term, there's also a, there's a product now, an Orbio product, which is another, another water-based cleaning product that we're doing pilots on that we've used with some success. Expensive product, but again, this product lasts many different, uh, different years, and you're making your own product, you're avoiding bringing chemicals into your environment. Wanted to touch on also with organic fields. Um, while that's not really what I'm doing here, I don't think that you can look at having a green environment inside your building if you don't have a green Pro, uh, program outside your building. Uh, some of the things with, uh, with chemical avoidance. Uh, traditional uh, systems for lawn care kills everything but the grass, destroys soil chemistry. Uh, organic programs builds up the soil chemistry, makes the, uh, the best, uh, best environment for grass to succeed. Uh, so it takes a couple of years to flip this over. But something else to keep in mind, uh, which I find interesting, is when you're killing the soil chemistry, you also kill off nematodes, which are the, uh, which are the products that keep grubs under control. So when you, when you use chemicals, a lot of times you, chemicals creates the need for more chemicals. So when you back out of this and go with a more organic solution, um, there's a benefit. And I think everyone's seen, we, we banned, uh, Roundup, the day I showed up in East Meadow, um, and I think we've all seen some of the horrible things about Roundup that um, I think a lot of us knew, but unfortunately, um, you know, took the, uh, the rest of the public to some time to catch up on that. So here's some of the savings. Uh, we don't use stripper anymore to, to lift wax, so it's 100% savings. We actually have this all broken down into, uh, into spreadsheets. Reduction in wax, we're just under 50%. The reason why is we're not going all the way down, building back up. We're, we're top coating every three years. We break down completely. Um, reduction in baseboard cleaner. I have here just under 90%. We even bought baseboard cleaner. I don't know how many years. If you don't have these, um, if you don't have this traditional wax that would be that you need to remove, you don't need it anymore. So that's now 100%. Uh, reduction in buffing chemicals. We don't use uh, buffing chemicals. With a diamond pad, you just use the pad and water. Okay, so this is just breaking down some of our some of our savings. The lighting I'm mentioning it really is not something we want to get into that deeply, but we did uh, we did high efficiency lighting on the outside of our buildings, and uh, that uh, saved on two different ways. It saves us uh, with the efficiency; it's about 80 percent more uh, efficient, but also it lasts approximately 11, 12 years, where the uh, with the previous lighting products we needed to change out about every three years. So it's you know people with a going out in the bucket truck and changing these fixtures, so there's a savings there also. We're also, um, we also do a lot in regard to finding different methods of recycling. Um, we also do some, uh, some different things with uh, energy curtailment, and um, we do things with partnerships where we try to uh, partner with the town of Hempstead in regard to some of the vehicles they have in regard to some of the maintenance we need to do at the end of the winter. Okay, now let's get back to what's important. 
Okay, this is, um, this is one, of the, uh, one of the quotes from my, from my dissertation. Uh, as for the impact on health, the safe and healthy school environment does more than benefit student health. It also improves academic performance and morale. It does more to, uh, than protect students. It also safeguards teachers and staff. What's the most important uh, aspect of a child's education? Safety, yep, you have to have, definitely have to have a safety, uh, safe environment. But when it comes to student achievement, the most important piece to this equation is contact time between the teacher and the student. So if you have products and, and, and students are having reactions and they're missing school time, it stands to reason that there's going to be an impact on achievement. Um, surprise, there's not more studies out there, there's, um, but this is something that was a piece of my dissertation and I could show you some of the correlations that we found. Also, teachers get sick too, and, and there's, um, there's impacts in regard to these chemicals on, on teachers. Uh, substitute teachers, we have substitutes in East Meadow do a great job. Still an interruption. Uh, it's, they're different than the teacher who uh, the students are used to uh, having in the class, so it does have a, um, an impact with the, stu with the teacher being out, of the, uh, being out of the equation as well. So, um, so that's a big piece of this in regard to the, uh, some of the issues. And just, some, just to touch on how these, how these chemicals really become issues for uh, teachers and students. Uh, when, we, uh, when we see problems in East Meadow, it's because people try to bring in products and try to, and try to do things in addition to what's in our program. We have people who will try to use wipes with, with triclosan in it um, and will wipe things down. Keep in mind, when you're, when you're introducing these, these products into the environment, triclosan doesn't break down. So as the water evaporates in any of these products, you have this buildup. We, uh, we don't have a great amount of, um, of airflow in regard to a room with 27 kids in it often, uh, along with a teacher. And now you're introducing these chemicals when teachers bring, uh, bring chemicals in. So we're very strict about making sure the teachers don't bring anything in. I actually provide a list for anything that's donated into our schools has to uh, comply with a list because we have the safety data sheets and the products that we have have been, um, have been uh, verified as safe by our research. Okay, this, is, um, this really gets into my, my dissertation. Talks about um, IEQ, I, I like to talk about IEQ instead of um, indoor air quality. I, like, I, I think uh, indoor environmental quality kind of deals with all the impacts. As we're dealing with taking chemicals out of the environment, there's less, um, there's less chemical exposures. Um, so I think that, that, that there's a synergy between, between uh, what we're doing with, in regards to our program with the cleaning and, um, and the quality of the environment. So these, these are things that we try to, to measure and that's why it's a piece of what we do. So what I did as part of my dissertation is I took a, as a baseline what we're doing in the East Meadow schools with our green program. And we did a survey compared to some programs that were good but not quite to East Meadow standards. And then we were able to find some programs uh, to participate. The worst didn't want to participate. But we were able to find some programs that were just fairly in compliance. And um, so this is really the breakdown. And this is based on the um, HMIS codes from the safety data sheets. As you can see, we're pretty, pretty consistent there. It's just zeros across the board for East Meadow. And you see the other pro uh, programs will fluctuate. OK, so here's my, uh, my research question uh, uh, focused on the extent of the impact uh, the use of chemicals has upon student achievement. OK, and what we did is we did the basic program. We kind of we broke down the three different programs. Now, this is something that was really, was really frightening for me. I knew that there was an impact. I just, it, there has to be an impact. If you have an olfactory uh, discomfort, uh, you, if you don't feel well, you don't, you're not going to do as well in school. But I was worried with such a, which, with a small sample size if we would see it. But what I found, and I remember I had a, um, a math expert working with me on this, and I remember, you know, or coming to me with, oh my God, we found it, we found it. So, so um, like I said, there's something that should be studied, we found over the course of the time that we showed as East Meadows program went forward and these other programs weren't quite in line with us, we did show that there was a, uh, a statistically significant impact on student achievement based on our change in programs. Okay, so, you know, I spent a lot of time talking about the savings of, 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 uh, 
of dollars on this, and, that, and that's important, because a lot, of, a lot of business people, they just want to hear about the bottom line. But what our true cause was, we were able to show this. In this small way, I'd like to see more research done, but um, this is something that, um, that I was very interested, uh, very interesting um, result. My uh, dissertation is available on ProQuest. If anyone sent me an email, I could send a PDF version if anyone wants to see this in more detail. Okay, uh, what I also did is I also wanted to look at, I also wanted to, to look at uh, student attendance. And we did see a drastic change in regard to student attendance. And here is the interesting thing. When I was speaking with my, my math expert on this, who was, who was helping me run the numbers, um, we saw that, that as the program went into effect, because we, we did it over several years, as our program got better, the amount of student absence decreased. And then all of a sudden, one year, there was a pop. And I'm like, boy, that's interesting. Now, we had tracked our green cleaning program. I actually have a timeline that goes back to the very beginning as we changed different aspects of the program. And where there was the pop, where we had a drastic change that jumped off the page, was the year we got away from traditional wax. That is what changed the equation. There was such a drastic change with the chemicals coming out. Um, I knew right away when I saw that, it was just a uh, eureka type moment that that was the wax. And um, that's, what we, um, that's what we saw. And um, I do think that um, while uh, we haven't had a, a, a lot of research done with this, this is a trend that's been shown in other districts as, there's, as they do pilot programs. That one school, um, a neighboring school, put, did a pilot program where they did one of their elementary schools, they tried a purely green program. And when they were looking at all the attendance data, not really thinking about what the change was about green cleaning, not really thinking that it would have an impact on, on the attendance issue, the administrators were looking, why is it that the attendance rate is so much better in this one building out of all of our buildings? It was a, uh, it's a big school district. It has like five or six elementary schools. And that was the program which had the, uh, the, green, the green program. So, like I said, we're seeing this. I think, you know, I'd love to see it uh, researched more. But um, like I said, uh, from, what, from what I've looked at it, we've, we've definitely seen an impact. So this is what, we've, this is what we look at. Uh, student health, health is paramount. The risks have been identified. Okay, we, we, we can show with our program that there's a positive impact, cost us less, we're having a positive impact on the uh, on the school uh, environment in regard to some of the uh, some of the ca contaminants being taken uh, out of our environment. We see all of um, all of these uh, different different issues. Where's the argument against it? Uh, I, I, Twenty years ago, I think you could make an argument against green cleaning. I, I don't agree with it today. There's no argument anymore. If you can if you can uh, if you could do it have a beneficial impact on student health, student attendance, and have a cost less. There's no argument against it anymore. That they, I, to me, the, um, the, the argument's over. Um, and we talk about energy efficiency. We look at the reason why we're so big on energy efficiency. My budget, if you look at the expenditures in the facilities department in East Meadow, it hasn't gone up in 10 years. It's because we're more efficient. We do things, we do things more efficiently. Um, so we, uh, you know, we, we are not, uh, it's not like we're spending more money to, uh, to do this. We, we look at that efficiency as being a part of su supporting what we're, what we're doing day to day. Superior products, use the best product for the job. Okay, the l uh, least expensive product is uh, usually not the best solution. Labor is your biggest cost, so you always have to manage labor uh, effectively. And lighting products, um, I mentioned some of the bonus in regard to, to that. So that's what I have for you today. So, um, thank you.